This is Alexa Linton, and you're listening to the Homers Podcast. We're now in season six. Thanks to all of you tuning in and sharing the podcast with your friends to keep the momentum going. This podcast is dedicated to all things horse and all things that uplift equine well-being and welfare. And I'm having down-to-earth conversations with equine professionals about the little things that move the dial slowly but surely towards a better world for horses. You'll find all the episodes, 93 and counting now, on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for being here and enjoy the ride. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. We're here for the Whole Horse Podcast, and I'm excited to be here with you all today. I've, I've taken a little break, and I'm back, and I'm here with Betsy Vonda and her beautiful baby. <laughs> Baby Sage is here too. Baby Sage <laughs> is here. Uh, welcome, Betsy. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, you know, like we were discussing the universe totally aligned at yeah. the times to bring us together oh, to have this conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had noticed one day that Betsy had like liked one of my posts. And of course, I'd seen uh, through the balance through movement method posts and some mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, things that Celeste had shared. Some of oh. your... Uh, yeah, success stories and mm-hmm. your uh, just one particular mare, I think, a rehab case. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh my goodness! And mm-hmm. um, so, yeah, these these pieces coming together. And then I reached out to Betsy to ask yeah. about the podcast. Mm-hmm. And she was like, yes, um, yes, definitely. So- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Here we are. I mm-hmm. want to start today. I'm sure a lot of people know you and, mm-hmm. and know about some of your work, but I'd love you to mm-hmm. share a little bit about what you're, you know, doing at the moment, what your passion yeah, is sure. and, and sort of, yeah, where, where you're at right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right now I'm, I'm yeah. one of the apprentice trainers with Celeste and the balance removal method. I do consider myself, I'm a postural and performance consultant. So I do get called in on a lot of cases where you know, it's just been the owner just feels in their gut. There's still something not quite right. And they just want another set of eyes to help look at their horse and help with the pillar work in some cases. But even last night, I had a really, really cool case. And it was just this one thing we did and the horse just yawned for 10 minutes and completely had a huge breakthrough, right? So sometimes it's just, you know, going through and being this unbiased second set of eyes to come in, look at all the information and help owners find like what could be this little missing piece. So I, I was trained in Celestner release um, uh, back in April. So that's been a really great addition. My first mm-hmm. actual body work modality, I still say I don't consider myself a body worker, but I do body work. <laughs> Some people would say, no, you're a body worker now. But yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun having this extra set. And you know, it's obviously now started the the thirst for more knowledge and body work and understanding more patterns and but yeah it's been it's been amazing and I've gotten to travel and meet a lot of horses and of course I always feel like the universe when I learn about something will then start to present I always say horses arrive to me to help me practice and learn and and now I say like I can see the head in a completely different way than I used to before I did the nerve release training like I knew I could feel something wasn't quite right but I didn't I didn't know what I was really looking at. And now I've got a whole other lens to understand the body too. The more that I'm learning how to help, um, you know, and offer some space in the face and how much that can help change the hind end. And it's just more and more layers. But again, it also makes you feel like the more, you know, the more you don't know, (laughs) which is always fun too. Right. I I know you've probably felt that way uh, a few times. Constantly. It's, it's a trap. It's a trap. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's so, it's such a great thing because it's like then, and I know my brain and I'm sure your brain is too. It's like, then you just, it gives you these reasons to go down these little individual rabbit holes and correlate different horse presentations, different clinical presentations, and then reopen the anatomy book and learn that bit of the horse a little bit better and draw new conclusions and, and really connect that, you know, presentation to what you experienced. And it's been so, so, so fascinating. And I feel like that's a good way for my brain to learn too, where, cause you can only take so much in at once. And then as you get cases, then you get a reason to look a little deeper, but then you can correlate that information to that case. And then it stays in your brain a little bit better too. So I think it's all meant to happen the way it does. So 
that's where I am right now. And then we'll talk as well as, as an owner, mm-hmm. whenever yeah. I lecture, I always start with, you know, I'm an owner as well, who's been through now two, three horses who have had undiagnosed lameness initially. And this one, my current mare took four years to finally come full circle to the diagnosis. But as we were talking, it was because it was meant to happen the way it did. And I always, you know, I don't want owners to feel when they reach out to me, like I haven't been there because I have hundred percent been there. (laughs) I know what it feels like to feel in your gut that there is something not right. And to just keep pursuing it and keep advocating until you get, you know, to an answer may not be the final answer, but I know what that feels like and how hard it is and the emotional toll it takes. And I can definitely share some more of what we found now about my own personal mirror, because I think people, again, it's like, it's hard. It's hard as someone who helps other people all day long to be struggling with your own animal and then to also get that diagnosis. But the vulnerability to share that we've all been there too. Like we're not up on a pedestal. We're not, we're not different than anyone we're trying to help. Right. Like we, we've all, most of us have been here and that's why we're in the work, right? I'm sure yep. <laughs> every every person can also relate to that. We don't go, oh, we're going to be rehab specialists because we've never had a lame horse like that. It's usually not the case. It, usually the fire got sparked for some reason. And yeah, I can definitely share um, finally coming full circle, my own mare that just happened recently. So mm-hmm. we can talk about that as well. Mm-hmm. And you know, we want to reflect there because I'm sure there's many body workers um, mm-hmm. and, and other, you know, people studying in this yeah. field and this sense that I, I love that highlight because I, I don't know if I've ever truly highlighted that before that sort of mm-hmm. like, what's that phrase where it's like, when when you're ready, the teacher will appear or like this sense yeah. of like coming to these junctions in our path where we're like, how did I not see this before? But yeah, also this yeah. recognition and this this acceptance that everything happens in its own time and for its own reason and the way that needs to happen to kind of open up that doorway that pathway and the animal like the animal comes and that's why I think people say like they are the best teachers Mm -hmm. because they're they're slowly trying to tell us and they're trying to show us and they're giving us symptoms or you know presentations but exactly they're also patient to know that we will get there like if you're open to learning like you will you will and I'm sure you've been through this too and many people listening to this will have as well you just know it in your gut and once you know that there could be an answer we just don't don't know how to find it yet you also don't give up like you just keep lurking and you know invite different people and I actually what I started to say to myself so if any other body workers or people are listening to this too what I started to say to myself as I was getting deeper and deeper into it, I started to say to myself that this was a client horse. Because what I realized is that a lot of us were looking at our own horses with so many layers and so many emotional (laughs) connections. And Mm -hmm. I I just started to say to myself, if this was a client horse, what would I say to them? And I had to almost step myself back and remove myself from from that situation in that way and just say to myself, turn off the biases, turn off the past. If this was a client horse presented to you today, what would you say to that client? Yep. And that was when I said, I need to get back x-rays and neck x-rays. Like that was, and I went back and I was listening to more of Audrey DeClue's podcast. And I was like, Hey, what haven't we investigated yet? And what, if this is a client horse, what would I say? And it would have been get back x-rays and, you know, and then the moment of feeling silly that I didn't think of it sooner, (laughs) I, I, you know, brought it up with, with my vet, but my horse didn't have enough symptoms. And, and I, again, I think because we were still meant to be at the time, you know, just at the end of May there, when I found out it was meant to happen then. And, and, and there's also a huge acceptance in that as hard as it was. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love. So, so often I hear, and I feel this way as well, that Mm -hmm. it's so hard to, I hear it all the time. It's so hard to work on my own horse, you know, for manual Mm -hmm. therapists. I can't work on my Mm -hmm. own horse. Mm -hmm. And I love that, just that space of, okay, can I step back and see this as a client horse? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. even, you know, yeah, like even for me, it's a case of, okay, like Mm -hmm. I need to actually come to my horses like I'm booked for a session. Yeah. Doing the thing that I do, getting paid by myself 
to do the thing yeah. like that yeah. kind of sense of neutrality that I would bring mm-hmm. to any client horse and I really yeah. love that that you highlighted that because I think yeah it is easy to miss things or put our horses mm-hmm. on the back burner or not do the things yeah. that we actually know how to do with our yeah. horses right yeah or what um, we yeah what we'd recommend to one yeah. of our other clients yeah. right and I I think that's it's that's exactly it is like we we also see and like I say to my clients all the time like take take pictures periodically. Cause you also, you see them every day in a lot of cases. Yep. So it's harder to notice the subtle changes when you look at the same horse every day, cause you're seeing it and the changes happen so slowly or the behaviors, you know, happen sporadically that you may not even see the full clinical picture. But if you're taking photos or videos and then you go, Oh wow, like this, there was a big change here. Or, you yep. know, I didn't realize that they were walking like that. And I think that's important too, for us to think, think about is like we often also see our horses every day and it's so it is sometimes hard to see the changes and so yeah to kind of take off all the all the biases and the emotional and and just look at our horses and be like okay wait like change the hat for a second I'm not the owner and the body work you know what does that look like yeah yeah Mm -hmm. that's beautiful Mm -hmm. when with animal communication we often talk uh, a great deal about neutrality and the sense Mm -hmm. of on a spectrum, how close am I to myself and seeing mm. my own stuff and my own fear and my own emotion mm-hmm. or whatever around it? Or mm-hmm. how close can I be to that animal and to actually mm-hmm. be able to see clearly what is, mm-hmm. what is needed and what is trying yeah. to be communicated? You know, it mm-hmm. can be pretty hard to come by, but I also think yeah. with practice, it, mm-hmm. it really with clarity and with practice and with intention on that. Okay. I'm going to find that space. It really can come. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah. I would love to hear, cause I know that there was some s- sort of events preceding you kind of coming to this awareness with your mare. And mm-hmm. I would love to hear mm-hmm. more. I know there was a client horse yeah. that has been yes. really a big learning for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically what happened. And again, this is like, I always say the universe and, you know, spirit, whatever you associate it to, you know, in my life, ever since I started following that intuition and just following, you know, the signs, if you want to call it that way, or, you know, just moving in the direction that my intuition says this, uh, this client had, um, it was actually her daughter had reached out to me. So I'd worked with her daughter and we'd helped resolve the kissing spine and her young barrel mare and then she had she had I think told me in passing that she was starting the work um bounce remove method work on her mom's horse but didn't tell me a whole lot just you know said that she's that she was going to start trying it so I never actually saw this mare she just told me and then a few months ago she told me okay so we actually we had her vetted again and same thing they'd gone through multiple vet assessments they'd owned her for almost uh I think since 2018 off the track thoroughbred um, was trained to be a barrel horse. And again, would have moments and the owner, she knows, she told me that she knew she wasn't just quite right, but she could still perform, but she would have these moments that she would just turn inside out and not be right. But then she'd get it together and she was a successful barrel horse, but she started having string halt like symptoms. And so that's when she, you know, sent her to her daughter and her daughter was doing the balance removal method work, but you know, she got better, but didn't quite you know, resolve and they ended up getting x-rays and found really, really horrible kissing spine and even the cysts in her back. And so they had made the, you know, really, really tough decision to donate her to science and to research because obviously kissing spine is a huge epidemic. I'm like pandemic epidemic at this point, what's the correct term? But, (laughs) you know, it's showing up in so many different disciplines and there's more awareness around it, but there's still that debate of, is there just more awareness around it? Is it actually getting worse? But we need research to find out what the, yep. you know, what the real story is. So Kim had uh, booked a call with me to have just basically a closing conversation. I'd never met her mom. I'd never met this mayor, but she's like, you know, can we do this? And then they made connections with the university and, but the date got moved a couple of times. So at the time we didn't know that my own mayor had also horrible kissing spine from being a racehorse. So we didn't know any of this when we were booking these calls. And then it, I found out right before um, I went to Tennessee, um, literally my vet was coming and my husband has been working with my mare since I had been pregnant and not riding and doing all of his training. 
And, um, you know, a couple of times it was like, okay, last May, I think it was, we found the hindgut oh. ulcers. And so we treated that. She got a little bit better. And then he was working with her. And then he went to run my mare again. And, and he had spent a full year training her and retraining her and treating her. And then when he, tr- he went to run her and had the same um, presentation. So, so my mare has always struggled with not being able to stop. Once she went over a certain speed, she couldn't stop. And the whole, ever since I got her, I was just looking back at all the photos and videos. There were all these little subtle things. And again, this was end of 2019. I did not know what I know now. And I was documenting all these little things that just were weird about her and not quite right. But, you know, we took her super slow because of COVID. There was no races. So I was on the ground with her for months. And then I brought her along really slowly. And but the entire time that I was trying to race her myself, it was like I'd say to him, it's like she can go a certain speed. But when she goes over the speed, she can't stop. And, you know, it's just very strange because she knows. And I'd say that to him. She knows she needs to stop and turn, but she can't do it. And, you know, like in hindsight, well, that makes total sense with the fusion she has in her spine. She can't stop. And it explains um, all of her symptoms. And my vet said it best. She's like, it's like we've been playing whack-a-mole for four years on this horse because we were treating all of these other symptoms that would come up. But again, we treat them and she'd do better. We treat her and she'd do better because we were, you know, relieving the symptoms, but never really getting to that root cause. And that was a very similar story with this mare, you know, inject the hawks, inject the stifles, x-ray this, she'd get a little better, and then she'd have an episode. And so basically, we're on this call together. And, and she was like, I don't really know, you know, what we're going to do. And I said, just tell me her story. Like, I just want to, you know, I hadn't, and I didn't tell her at first, when we started talking, I didn't tell her that I was going through the exact same thing. But as we started talking, I was like, that happened with my mare too. And like, you need to know, like, I literally just got this diagnosis as well. And in hindsight, as we're going through, there's so many correlating things. But again, it's these mares, they're tough as stink, man. And they are so gritty and they just want to try so hard. And they were telling us things and we're trying to listen. But if you don't, you know, you don't know, and they're not that classical presentation, like my mare has never palpated back sore. And, you know, based on what we see in her spine, we're like, how is that possible? But again, if prey animals. Yep. Absolutely. They do everything your week. It's not, you know, so she, she'd tell you about certain movements or, you know, certain things, or she just wouldn't be able to do something athletically, but it would be explained by sore stifles or sore hawks or ulcers or, you know, all these other things. And that was a very similar story with this other mare. And we were talking through and we just totally had a moment for each other where we're just like, you know, it's okay that we didn't know. And we also shouldn't shame ourselves for what we did in the meantime for what we didn't know. And that's something I say to clients all the time. Like you don't, like you didn't know. So don't go back and beat yourself up because that's not productive energy to move forward with. But, you know, the lesson here is that now we know, now we must do better. And, you know, we will listen to horses and you will, she said, you know, she put up a post and she's like, I will never not. She's like, the first place I will go is back x-rays. Fortunately, it's these hard lessons we have to learn, but it, it was ruling all these other things out. And I really feel now that my mare was meant to come to me so that I would continue to listen and I wouldn't stop. And I needed to learn this atypical presentation of kissing mm-hmm. spine. And some people may say, well, it's super obvious. And I'm like, it was, but it wasn't. Again, she's my own mirror. And when we treat something, she would get better. And we treat something and she would get better. And she could contort herself and do. And my husband would say that. He's like, I can put her together and she can do it, but then she can't hold it. And I can put her together and she can do it, but then she can't hold it. And that was the red flag for him, especially once he started working his own, um, you know, three and four year old and, and feeling how quickly she would build and build and build and build. And my marriage just couldn't. So he's like, no, there is, there's still something. And, you know, we made the decision to get the vet. Well, the vet was coming again. So we're like, let's just stop riding her. And just, I said to my vet, when she walked to the door, I was like, you're taking my bank account today. Cause I can't, I can't yeah. mentally keep going. Like I, I need to know what is wrong with her. Like I can't do it anymore. And I know lots of clients have been in those shoes where you're just like, okay, we've already spent so much money. We've investigated so many other different things, but you know, I don't care what it's going to cost because you love this horse and you want to know because she's a performance horse. So she's meant to be, um, you know, that's why we bought her was to train her and then eventually sell her because we want to make good, awesome barrel horses And that was her purpose was she was going to come to me. She was going to be the first horse that I trained and sold. I've kept pretty much all my horses (laughs) unless, 
you know, like every horse. I, I still have my guy. He's with my sister in the field retired. So this was the first horse where I was like, oh, yeah, we'll train her and sell her and it'll be great. And then it was like, oh, no, she's here for another reason. <laughs> and and I think this yeah. was it. And that's what, you know, this woman also like she's like, you know, I've taken how many horses off the track? Um, and they've gone on to be successful show jumpers and hunters. And, you know, she's been in horses for years. And she's like, how did I miss this? And I'm like, it, it's not your fault that you did. Like, your mare also was incredibly stoic and doing whatever we asked of her, you know, like, they're, and this is what I want everyone to understand about these animals is how when we, we really are at the point where we're seeing behavior, we're seeing subtle lamenesses, they're in a lot more pain. Because I think us as humans, we go, well, if I was hurting, I would limp. And it may not be that severe, but, you know, we're going to limp. But if, if a prey animal is at the point where they're limping, it's pretty bad. And even then, they're still trying to dampen that down. Like, they're limping, but they're probably not limping as much as they would really want to limp because they're still trying to not appear as vulnerable. And and that's really hard for some people to understand because I think, again, the correlation is your own body. And you go, well, you know, if I was limping like that, it wouldn't be that bad. And I'd still be doing X, Y, Z and, you know, it can't keep me down. And it's like, but that's not the same experience for these prey animals. It's, it's not. And if we're finally seeing it, it's because it's actually been pretty bad. And it was actually at the point of you started having tension or you started having resistance. Yeah. And Audrey Clue has an amazing podcast on the pain behavioral pyramid that she, you know, correlated, took from human medicine to horse medicine, where, you know, the first sign is tension. I think it's like tension, resistance, refusal, mm -hmm. and then behavior. There's five, I can't remember the top head, but, it, but it's a long, you'll feel tension, and then you'll feel resistance, then you'll feel refusal, and then there'll be behavior. And, and they kind of go up and up the pyramid, where if you're at the point of buck bolting, rearing, and refusing, and, you know, sport horse aside, you know, like, sure, if it's a young horse, they don't understand. But some people use that argument. But I say, well, I look at a lot of young horses who are just starting, who had a pasture accident when they were one, yeah. and it was missed. And they didn't have a big cut, or they didn't have a big, you know, obvious trauma, but they wiped out and they hurt themselves. And because no one was working with them every day, no one noticed. And now we're trying to put them in work. And they are not doing well. And it's because of this thing that happened that wasn't super obvious. So I also kind of go, yeah, some young horses don't know or aren't trained, but also they can have imbalances too. <laughs> they can have things going on too that even can from, cause this. You, but. you know, like mm -hmm. Big Celeste talks about even from birth that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe mm -hmm. they, their shoulder girdle hasn't unraveled yep. appropriately or, you know, Absolutely. I see this with cranial bones all the time from birth. Mm -hmm. I work on human babies all the time who yep. need support around mm -hmm. uh it's it's a it's a big deal to come into the world and yeah Absolutely. like lots of souls mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. accidents my merit raven i i believe yeah. that's the case and yeah I, I so appreciate this you sharing around and i can hear your mm -hmm. emotion as well with, with oh yeah this, it's right? so hard it's, big mm -hmm. like it's so yeah. big and to yeah. have as well I've seen these horses as a body work you see these horses and mm -hmm. I think it's so important to highlight these stoic horses mm -hmm. because they will not flinch they don't have They'll the show same. you yeah mm -hmm. exactly their but reflexes different ways. are different mm -hmm. in a lot of ways and uh yeah they'll show you in other ways you know potentially like you say ulcers mm -hmm. so a visceral somatic connection mm -hmm to the issue the area of issue mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. or you know these other like internalized stress responses or tension or like you say like mm -hmm. these different mm -hmm. more nuanced resistances or changes yeah you know yeah yeah mm -hmm. lack of performance and yep. that is very vague and i think it's also very hard right now and this is you know a huge struggle in the industry and when i was talking to another vet the other night we both had a bit of a chuckle over how what's not normal is so common that we're worried, you know, there's a degree of people don't know what normal is anymore because there's so much abnormal out there. And I think some of what we're seeing and is starting to get highlighted on social media of what is being passed at the highest level vet checks that should kind of be a catch for, you know, what a sound truly prepared to be ridden and competed horse should look like. Things are being passed that, should not be in a lot of people's opinions because there's not enough muscle there's so much obvious dysfunction there's unbalanced tubes there's poor tack fit there's 
evidence of a lot of things and it being dismissed as, you know, well, that's just what they have to look like to compete at that level. Well, how is an amateur supposed to know what their horse should look like and move like if the horses at the highest levels are being presented with these levels of dysfunction we see and the body condition we see and the development muscle development we see or lack of, I should really highlight, you know, like how is the average person supposed to know what is normal or what isn't normal? And how is the average professional supposed to know what is normal? What is abnormal when it's being, it's being advertised literally in ads by companies are, are showing, you know, Oh, this is great. And we're like, wait a minute. Oh, that's what you think it is. And, like when you know, someone like, has a, an ad for like a hoof product and the hoof is like, <laughs> yeah. or I saw, I saw um, a five-star eventer. I saw, I stumbled across his post for him advertising the, the feed that he's feeding his horse. And oh. it was a one out of five on the body scale. And I was like, yeah. and the feed company was like, I'm so, I'm so happy to be feeding this horse for five years. And I'm like, I can see every bone on that horse's body. That is not a fit conditioned horse. Just because their hair is shiny, that is not our benchmark of a well-fed, well-nutritioned horse. Like that should not be our benchmark. But again, that's a five-star eventer. Came across it because I, you know, Instagram showed me the reel of his horse getting put on a plane to fly to Belgium. And I was like, uh pretty sure i know the ad <laughs> yeah and i was like that horse is getting and because you know because some people argue well you know by the time they're at the vet check you know they're just you know maybe they're a little dehydrated they're a little stressed from travel and i'm like well i saw the horse getting on the plane and it looked the same if not you know just or it looked the same when it went through the vet check and it was not a horse that you could even fit a saddle to because there was no latissimus to put a saddle onto um, you know, when you can see the ribs all the way to the shoulder blade, that's not conducive with carrying a rider. And I don't, you know, like I'll, I'll die on that cross. Like that's not fair to the equine athlete. And I think, you know, it's harder. It is true. People ask me all the time, how do you go to competitions and how do you do this? I'm like, because people, you know, I have empathy. Like, I didn't know what I know now. Yeah. And a lot of people, they don't know what they don't know. And yeah, I see it. And yeah, it's hard. But also like the horse is also living in a place where that's in some cases the life, the only life they've known. So and it's, you know, the more I talk to other animal communicators like Shaylee, and she's like, you know, the horses are only a lived experience. They don't necessarily know what their life could be like us humans. They they don't do the craving thing necessarily. Usually, not always. Usually. Not always. Yeah. But I've I've worked, I I worked for years at a big barn near me here. Mm -hmm hunter mm-hmm. jumper, very mm-hmm. traditional. And it was interesting to work with those horses and communicate mm-hmm. with them because mm-hmm. many of them were in a condition where I was like, mm-hmm. 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 you know, 75% mm-hmm. of them, it was shared with me. We're on Prevacox, like, like mm-hmm. all these pieces. But when I asked those horses, like, do you want to leave here? Mm-hmm. Like, this is the life that they've known mm-hmm. previous to this. Mm-hmm. They were in a similar environment yep. and scenario yep. and for them it was kind of like well I'm pretty content that is cool. here mm-hmm. you know it's a bigger paddock than I've been in before like you yep. know I get to touch my what, neighbor what they? that's pretty cool this sense <laughs> of like <laughs> and it, mm-hmm. it's but sounds, that's all they're comparing to. it's all yeah. they're comparing it to right mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. yes you meet those certain horses that are like that are like that's oh my gosh okay. I had one horse one time and you guys are all gonna think I'm totally freaking nuts <laughs> yeah. but She literally was like, I need you to adjust my wings. Can you adjust my wings Mm. today? And I was like, okay. So I said to the owner, I'm like, so we seem to have a Pegasus going on around here. Like, I do not know what's Mm -hmm. happening, but this horse is, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes, got something else going on um, and -hmm. is living in that space. Mm -hmm. But as a general rule, this is, this is not Mm -hmm. occurring. I mean, I think my mare diva like mm-hmm. she has this crazy little forelock um, and I call it her unicorn hol- horn holder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's got like mm-hmm. double whirls and, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. that's what that yeah. is. Um, yeah. And she knew, you know, she knew mm-hmm. exactly that she was putting herself in my life and all of those things. Mm-hmm. And that happens mm-hmm. as well. Like we see mm-hmm. that with certain horses where they, yeah, it's like they have a path and they are, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they know where they're headed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I'm sure you've 100%. met those ones as well where you're like, okay, you're different. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And that's what I feel like minor has definitely been for me. Like 
So I can totally, totally relate to that. But yeah, it's so interesting because when we go down these little rabbit holes, it's like there's so many things to consider when we're looking at these horses and like obviously people are like, well, they're competing and like obviously they're fine. And it's in their minds, like you said, well, compared to what it was, like of course they're they think they're, you know, it's great, but like also to a degree, it's like there's safety aspects and there's ethical aspects. And you know, just because that horse thinks it's fine. Like I, I I compare this actually to when I started getting healthy myself and I started really like, I feel like there's like a sliding scale of how well you can feel. Mm -hmm. And most people, their scale is very small because they've maybe only felt crappy or a little bit crappier. And, but again, if you've never experienced vibrant health, then your scale is very small. And as you start to make changes, like I still remember going through, I went through a really bad, like depressive, angry episode right after I got my dream job, had an amazing, you know, spouse had, you know, what from the outside looked like this wonderful life, but I had no goals. I was eating like crap. I wasn't drinking enough water, you know, I was living on fast food and inside I was really, really crappy. And I'd had brain fog my entire life in hindsight, but I didn't know. So when I started making these little changes and I started drinking more water and I started eating whole foods and I started working out and taking vitamins and trying to run my body as efficiently. And I went through a period where I stopped eating wheat. And that was when it took three weeks for my brain fog to lift after I stopped Mm -hmm. eating wheat. And I still remember the moment I was driving in the car and I looked at him and I said, that's what tree leaves look like. Because I'd had so much peripheral brain fog for my entire life that I did not know how clear my vision could be. But once you experience that, now your scale is a heck of a lot bigger because now my scale has, wow, and then I can see clearly and feel vibrant and healthy. And then I still remember what it felt like to live with brain fog and low energy and angry thoughts. And so my scale yeah. got a lot bigger. So then the question really becomes, is it okay to let someone or something continue living with this really small scale yeah. of proper crappier? Or is it ethical to allow that scale to expand and be as full as possible? Because I think that's what is important for us as humans versus, you know, to have that scale instead of just living. But then I guess there is that ethical question, you know, well, if they don't know any better, then should we just let them? And I know we talk about this sometimes with Warwick definitely brought it up about bringing horses out of shutdown. Is it fair to bring a horse out of shutdown if they will not be honored in that anymore? Yeah. And, and that's, like, that's oof. Mm-hmm. What like a that question. does it hits you in the feels what because, a question yeah because is, yeah if, if, if they're not going to continue in that state yeah mm-hmm. like it is such an ethical mm-hmm. question and yeah you know yeah. I think yeah like what an unpacking I think for that one that's it's a whole yeah. couple of podcasts for sure Yo, oh yeah but oh. I think there's you know we can definitely continue to go and I think for the the owners that listen to your podcast and for the people out there that want to do, yeah. you know, better and best by their work, keep, keep trying to like, don't, don't give up and you are not crazy. Ah. Oh, that's so many owners that they're, they're like, I felt like a crazy person because everyone around me oh, yeah. has been telling me my horse is fine and my horse just has an attitude or, you know, they're not that stiff and they're not. And I'm like, you know, and I always try and play devil's advocate. I'm like, because to that person, what they know that is your horse is fine. You know, it doesn't mean that you're wrong and it doesn't mean that they're wrong per se. It just means that they don't know. And I don't think now I'll give the caveat. I think some people may gaslight people. Um, But I think for the more majority of people are not necessarily out there trying to make you feel crazy or trying to dismiss your concerns. It's just that in their mind, it is normal and it is okay. But it's also okay for you to trust your gut and to keep looking for answers And if you feel like there isn't something right with your horse to keep pursuing that because you were going to learn so much coming out on the other side of it. And I've been going back and listening through your podcast, especially the ones like with Laura and talking about, you know, the the soul contract with these animals and Mm -hmm. that, you know, often in death, there is a lesson and we all can agree. There's plenty of lessons, not just in death, but along the way too, that, you know, most animals have something to teach us. And just if we're willing and ready to learn. And I think everyone at some point in their life will get that animal. I think it's just timing. It's all timing and it's all meant to play out the way it's meant to play out where you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. Well, again, I think people are very similar where, you know, they can have case after case after case, but there will be one horse or one situation that will come that will prompt them to change. 
change. And, you know, I think the more that we talk about this and we have conversations and thank God for social media in a lot of Mm -hmm. cases, because we are getting to spread the awareness of what's possible. People will slowly come around and, you know, will start to change for their horse. And it's some of those profound changes. Like I know with Warwick, you know, it was his wife's horse. He bought his wife's horse. Oh, he's spooking. I can fix that. And then look at the journey he's been on. And it's that one horse. So I think everyone at their own timing And I think there's definitely a shift in the industry right now that more and more people are saying, wait a minute, I don't know if this is right. I don't, I think we should maybe have more ethical conversations. And I think us, us as also practitioners being open to share our own stories, um, it will help everyone because if we think that no one at the top is dealing with lameness or is dealing with, you know, not knowing the answer then you can, you, it not that it's intended, but some people will feel less. Yeah. They'll feel like, well, why can't I figure this out? I must be a crappy owner. You know, like, look at these people. They're figuring all these cases out. It's like, we're, no, we're just like you. Like, no one's perfect. No one knows everything. And don't feel like you're a horrible owner because it's taking you five years or seven years or 10 years. Yeah. And you've just known that there's something with your horse. Like you've been doing the best you can the entire time. Just like I've been doing the best I could by this horse for what I knew. And at the end of the day, you know, it wasn't enough. And I think also part of the lesson is for her to come and show me that I can't fix everything because, you know, I was feeling like really confident helping a lot of these kissing spine cases. Like when I can get, you know, a clinical resolution in 12 weeks because the spine was touching, but was that really the issue? Not a lot of the time. But now I know if there is fusion and depending on where that fusion is, we might not be able to help your horse or we may, but it's me being very clear and knowing it's worth a try, but the horse will tell us, the horse will tell us if the work's going to work. The horse will tell us if they have the capability of getting better or not. And, you know, I also have another case in the UK, wonderful mare who, you know, has all this arthritic changes and narrowing of nerve root um, formins and narrowing into on her spinal cord who she was told you can't do anything for her. She's going to end up having to be put down. And that mare is defying everything and doing amazing. I've got cases on this spectrum and I've got cases on the other spectrum. And every horse is an individual. And why as much as we can look at other cases and say, well, yeah, I, I did have this horse that got better and defied the diagnostics, but some horses will and some horses won't. And either way, it's okay. Like it's, it's worth trying. And when people reach out to me, I say, you know, this is worth trying because this is why we say it's diagnostic as well, because it'll either help us find something else or the horse's body will not be capable of changing. And that's okay. Like I've had owners that tried this work and, you know, it was the last straw and it didn't work or it did work in a way that it revealed the true diagnosis. And the diagnosis was something we can't change. And, you know, the work that has been going in to try and help these horses and stabilize these horses didn't work. And it's okay then to have peace of that and to be done and to make a decision like euthanasia. And again, to give, like, I think you guys said it in one of your podcasts, you know, there's worse things than death or there's worse things in life than death. And, you know, we can have this conversation about choosing euthanasia versus choosing to leave them in the field or to move them on to another home, because that's the decision I was faced with. And, you know, I'm still not fully decided of what we're going to do. But the decision was to just let my horse be a horse right now and see how she does, because she's a case where biomechanically she cannot function. She she is fused with her spine at a negative angle. So she does not have the ability to um, generate energy through her hind end to her forehand. So it explains why she got so much muscle everywhere, because everything's having to work for her to just move herself through space. She has, you know, some mineralization in her in her spinal ligament. So that's another thing I will just caveat as well have your vet if your horse is diagnosed if they have the skill set to ultrasound the spinal ligament because i had asked Bree about that it's my vet and you know audrey de clue talks about it because it may not necessarily be the bones that's painful it may be that gigantic ligament that is damaged and you know there's not a lot of talk about it we're quite happy to talk about ligaments and tendons and legs getting hurt there is a massive ligament that runs from their head to their tail and it's right what you sit on and it can be very damaged and very painful And so that's my other little side note. Like when we were looking at my horse, she was thinking, oh, maybe this is actually where most of her pain is coming from, not necessarily the bones. So that's my other little side note about that. But I I appreciate that side note. Yeah, I think it gets missed. And I've seen Mm -hmm. like nuchal ligament damage um, Mm -hmm. from whether pullback injury or yeah, just chronic tension or Mm -hmm 
various things mm-hmm. and then yeah super mm-hmm. spine super spinous as well spinous. so yeah I yeah think I think that... it's more common people because people see the yeah. nuchal ligament right when there's damage at C2 totally. it, it flips around people are yeah. like oh what is oh happening <laughs> what is that happening and people will can see it right but it's totally. harder to see spinal it's ligament damage right see the spinal ligament yeah it's really hard to see it mm-hmm. but when she was going along with the ultrasound it was like yep there's the this and mm-hmm. there's that it was like oh man that does not look good so you know it's it's worth also checking on that and that's why i love like listening to audrey and 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 dr kate on the horse first podcast too because they talk about all the little things that can go wrong in the back and it's not even if it's not spinous processes it it could be the facets it could be the transverse joints like Mm -hmm. could be the nerve roots coming off the spinal cord like there's so many things in there that just because the spinous processes don't look that bad doesn't mean your horse's back is totally clear so you know when we when we talk about my mare like she's also been experiencing sciatica Mm -hmm. i now know and Mm -hmm. kate confirmed and i was telling her some of the symptoms so something I, I found the video. So the first time was December of 20 or of 2019. And we had just finished, you know, doing some trot work over ground rails and I turned her loose and she followed me to the middle of the arena and I was just picking up the lunge line and she just stopped and turned her butt to me and presented it to me right in front of me. And I was like, uh, what you doing? Like, so you scratch your butt, but like, I was like, I don't know what you want me to do with this. So I scratched her butt and she's been presenting her butt to me ever since. And like, it very much is like a do something about this. And I'm like, can, I can you know please do the nerve like. release, mom? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm like, girl, I don't I, what to do right now. And, and, you know, it got to the point where, you know, if I was in her stall with her, like I walk in her stall and sometimes she would like almost hip check me into the wall, like do something about my butt, mom. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. And I didn't know. Again, it's hilarious to think about this now because as a paramedic, so for those who don't know, I'm also a paramedic. Um, how many patients I picked up with severe sciatica off the ground, um, grown ass men, pardon me, I swore, but you know, men crying because they're sciatica, sciatica is horrible. And, you know, in hindsight, it's like, crap, she's had this the whole time. And so one of the things that um, another one of her symptoms, so she started getting all these rubs, um, like, you know, there's that I'm like trying to describe it for people. So there's their seat bones, like mm-hmm. basically under their tail. Yep. And there's the crease between her, you know, semitendinosis and her biceps. Yep. Well, she started having all of this ruffled hair just above oh, that yeah. bone. Um, yep. You know, all and I'm like, what is this? And how are you doing it? Because I, again, I didn't realize that horses, it sounds silly saying it, having sciatica. Yep. So their sciatic nerve, right, runs along runs, through there. And yep. Yep. And I was like, what is this? And, you know, sometimes it, it was her tail, but it was always more like on her butt, you know, up above those seat yep. bones, you know, to either side more in that crease. Yep. And I was like, what in the world is this? And how are you doing it? Because it's in a really weird place for a horse to itch. And then finally, I saw I was I went in the stall and it must have been really bad that day. And she dropped her hip and she threw her butt into the wall and she started rubbing it. And I was like, what in the world? Oh my God. And I was like, God, she's, and then I met Celeste and she's like, so horses can have sciatic nerve fires. And I was like, Oh my God. And I'm like, and some of them. So when I was just talking to Kate, she was like, yeah, it's like they get almost like some of them get probably get like a numbness, a tingling, a buzzing, like just this irritation. So they're trying to put pressure on it, you know, to rub it out or make it stop. And she has, we are in a barn that used to have race horses. We have race gate and I knew she knocked her race gate off once. And then she did it again the other day. And then I'm looking at the holes and I'm like, she's done it more than once where she is rubbing on the race gate to rub her sciatica. And I was like, oh my God. And it's not constant, but it, it comes and goes. And, you know, she has, so she had those symptoms, you know, tight hamstrings. Yeah. So with her, a lot of the symptoms that we thought initially were ulcers was she never wanted you to touch her chest, her low mm-hmm. neck, um, around her girth, around her shoulders. Um, in hindsight now, she probably has some degree of um, nerve irritation, brachial plexus irritation. And, you know, since she didn't want the saddle on at times, you know, not always, but at times didn't want the saddle. So I, then I met again, met Celeste and she's like, yeah, and then there's a brachial plexus in the shoulder. And sometimes when they're, you know, biomechanically dysfunctional and they don't have proper support, they can get nerve. So I was like, oh, this is it. She's got this too. And we'll just, you know, do the work. And, but again, hasn't worked. <laughs> so she's still got these, you know, overdeveloped shoulders and really irritated. And then I had a Cairo that was, I know another 
you know, thing. I had another chiropractor out and she's like, oh, maybe it's her ribs along her sternum. So she adjusted those and no, still symptomatic. And so like I've had, you know, amazing osteos, we've PMF, um, I have amazing performance vet. We've had Cairo. I'm trying to think I've had, you know, my girlfriend Holly came, like we've had a lot of different people come see this horse, work on this horse, different barriers, like even my own barrier, when I switched to him, he did like, he was the one who first picked up that she was interfering with her one hind leg on the other. I yeah. I didn't even know she was doing that because she'd always kind of have this J call it the J walk yep. where she's so tight in her hind end. Yeah. So she comes in and under and then steps out. Yeah. And, you know, so she's had all these little symptoms all along, but again, a lot of people, oh, and she's just tight, you know, just work her get stronger. And I'm like, well, we've been trying <laughs> and it's not working yeah. <laughs> and now it, it all makes sense. But it's these little things that, you know, some people are like, oh, that's weird. And like, I even had her, I had a different vet and I was explaining, you know, I was like, yeah, cause she was just there. I forget what she was doing. And I was like, oh, um, can I just ask you? Cause like my mare's got these rubs on her butt and I can't figure it out. Like what the heck she's doing. So she's like, you know, we can check her for beans. We checked her for bean. We checked her for pinworms. Like, you know, I've had other vets look at her too. I've had other body workers look at her and it's like, but again, it's like this you know, subtle thing that was just kind of lingering under the, under the surface. And when I bought her, yeah, people, I bought her sight unseen off of, off a of video off Facebook. <laughs> again she's meant to come to me and um when she came she was she couldn't even lope to the right like I'm thinking back to you know because I wrote her and I was like oh yeah no we're doing ground rehab full restart because I'm like she was so unbalanced and so that's been like but she just finished racing she was racing in the spring Mm -hmm. you know so it's like you go through and in your brain you can come up with reasons for everything but at the end of the day it's like you know okay so biomechanically she she can't carry a rider it's not ethical to ask her to carry a rider. Right now, she's she's comfortable being in the field. I did have uh, our animal you know, communicator. We work yeah, with her. Um, I was going to say. Shaley. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Shaley just talked to her and she said, you know, at this moment, she's not in 24-7 um, pain, but her, she, you know, she feels like her back can't move. She yeah. has a ton of compensations for that. She's really uncomfortable going inclines and declines. So any type of hills when my property is not perfectly flat where she stays um, and movement is uncomfortable yep. is what she told Shaley. Yep. But if she's standing there, no, she's not in, in pain. Say, so she's not moving anywhere. And that's, she's it's not interesting. moving anywhere. It's interesting yeah. as we're talking, I'm sort of connecting in and that's, that was yeah. similar what to what was. I was receiving. Yeah. And it, and it yeah. brings up this really interesting <laughs> question because I think mm-hmm. You know, for you, there, there, yeah. Mm-hmm. There's big decisions in the future, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But sometimes, yeah, and for for our listeners as well, it does. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing. So my mare Raven, for example, yeah, is uncomfortable under like being ridden, yes. but otherwise she's sound and happy mm-hmm. and. Mm-hmm not yeah. in pain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do think that there's this, yeah, that, you know, and this is, this is something that you're grappling with and working with right mm-hmm. now. And I think so many mm-hmm. people are here. get to that point mm-hmm. where it's like, well, they, they, yes, can't be ridden without pain, but also mm-hmm. is their quality of life mm-hmm. and that's at a the point question. that mm-hmm. they could live out in a field like a horse yeah. and be yeah. okay. And that, you know, it's, it's a heartbreaking question, really, you know, yep. it comes down to yeah. it, right? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, knowing what I know, and that's why I also think that, you know, the timing of everything is at the point where, yeah, like biomechanically, and then having Kate confirm this too, it's like her engine can't work, yep. you know, like she can't, she can't transmit energy through her spine. She can't support a rider with her thoracic sling properly and like I was looking at her last night so she's been like totally out of work for six weeks now and I'm like oh her neck's looking better because she was having to use her neck so much to hold herself up and hold us up and move herself through space and her neck was getting tighter and tighter and tighter and I'm like this is not good this is the opposite of what we want and you know so it's like she's not in a place biomechanically where she can carry a rider and she can't turn. So she literally is fusing um, in multiple vertebrae. And when you watch her, you see where the energy dies. And you yeah. see she almost has like this waddle to her pelvis because yeah. the energy has nowhere to go. And when I'm looking at, okay, she also has stifle drop. So I call it stifle drop. I don't want the technical term. So she doesn't lock, but it's like her femur slips through. Or I'm sure patella swings up. I'm not sure the exact term. I haven't had the vet hasn't witnessed it yet. But basically her leg will just give out. Yeah. Her hind leg will just buckle. Yeah. 
And again, it's not a lock stifle, but it's like the stifle buckle. And like, I picked up her, her left hind last night because the farrier, she's due for the farrier again. And I picked up her left hind and just her right just gave out. Yep. And so it's like these things. And then again, you think about where a foot needs to go to get trimmed and she has to stand on three legs and she has yep. no rotation through her spine. And I think that's when Shaley said she's, you know, struggling with the incline decline. Well, yeah, because her hind legs can't yep. work properly. And so then you think, okay, well, she, we don't have a perfectly flat property and could we find that? Yeah, maybe, but again, how long? And yeah. we've, she's been out of work for six weeks. And even my husband last night, he's like, yeah, I'm seeing her hind end. It's starting to go again yeah. because that's, that's the double-edged sword with her is if Without you the rehab. force her to move. Exactly. If you force her to move, yep. she stops dropping stifles, but then her neck gets tighter and her back gets sore. Yep. So And that's where we need to have the ethical conversations. And I think her name was Beck. Someone did share, you know, when is it ethical to rehab a horse? And this is a fantastic conversation. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And she said, you know, if you rehab, if the horse can be rehabbed and what rehab should be, because again, horses are different than humans, right? Like if like us humans, we know to a degree, if we get injured, we will appreciate there may be only so much we can do. And we may have to live with some chronic pain, but we can make that decision. And obviously no one's killing humans. But when it comes to horses, like where the ethics come in is if the horse is damaged and injured to the point where if you have to continue to rehab them at the expense of something else, and they cannot maintain a quality of life on their own in the pasture without rehab, is it ethical to continue to rehab them? And that is the question because is that fair to the horse? Because what we're basically doing is we've been trying to rehab her for four years. But in hindsight, you know, we look back, if you give her any time off, she deteriorates. So she cannot maintain her basic level of function to have a normal quality of life on her own. And this is where, yes, there are people who are willing to do the things every day and to continue up with the injections and they don't care if they ride their horse and they can keep them comfortable with pain management. And if that's your decision and that's your commitment, absolutely. But not everyone and every horse can meet that, right? And it's like with my horse now, it's like, okay, well, we have to move her, which makes her sore to keep her yep. from being sore. And it's like, but it's a double-edged sword right now. Like yeah. it's it's all uncomfortable. And we always say with the balance removing method, we never want to strengthen something at the expense of something else. Yep. Absolutely. And that is what's been going on with my horse. Yeah. And that's what we see happen in a lot of rehab situations where people are being instructed to do things at the expense of something else in the body. And that's what we really don't agree with. It's like they they should like a normal horse who doesn't have major roadblocks. And even if they have an injury, we should be able to develop them to a place without the, you know, causing harm to anywhere else in their body. And then once they get to that place, they're rehabbed and they can continue to maintain that development, you know, on their own to a degree where they would be safe and sound in the field. And then they would obviously need additional development to be able to ride. But if you're having to constantly do something that is going to, you know, be detrimental to the horse, or it is just more than you can give emotionally and time and money wise. And without all of that effort, that horse will not be comfortable in the field, then it is totally okay to consider a purposeful and, you know, thoughtful death for them. And a lot of people may or may not agree with that. But again, I think that's part of the contract with some of these horses that they're also meant for us to learn and accept that we can't fix everything. Because I think as humans, we're Mm -hmm. a lot of us are fixers. And, you know, especially with modern medicine, a lot of people, and this happens very much in the medical world right now, where, you know, I follow a really great page and it's, um, it's an RN who talks about DNR, like, do not resuscitate and, yep. and the extreme measures that a lot of humans are put through. And if you ask a lot of healthcare practitioners, we don't want to be kept alive on machines because we know what that looks like. But again, a family who doesn't know what that looks like, maybe like, yes, do everything and keep doing everything, even when their, their human, you know, has, has gone and is, you know, never going to wake up again, needs to be kept alive by machines. And, you know, we're at the point where it's like, okay, we can continue to do all these things, but it's not going to change the outcome. And it's a really hard conversation to have and a really hard conversation to accept. And it's heartbreaking and it's really, really tough, but it's when we think about quality of life versus quantity of life, what, what do people want? And when we buy animals and we take on animals, that is the decision you are potentially being handed to consider that for your animal of quality versus quantity. And I think it's really important to, you know, as much as they bring us so much joy, if they're suffering, 
is that a decision that you need to consider? Yeah. And it, there's no shame in that. And it looks different for everyone. Like for some people, they just financially can't afford it. They can't afford the, you know, if your horse needs $400 a, you know, a month in medication, that's a lot of money for people. And if they have responsibilities already to other animals and other family members, that's a lot. And if the horse is just going to continue to deteriorate, and it's, you know, maybe they're okay today, but in six months, they're not going to be, yeah. it's okay to have that conversation. And, you know, some people, it makes them really uncomfortable maybe because I've, I've been around a lot of human death too, that, you know, I've seen also the peace that can come from it. Like it's, there's worse things in life than death. I think, again, I heard that, oh. you know, on, oh, yeah. Big time. on your podcast, and, and on your podcast. Mm-hmm. When I talk to horses about it, like, and I think I said this in my mm-hmm. podcast with Dr. Rainwaters is like, you know, they're not scared of it. They're not, uh, mm-hmm. most of them are like, yes, let's do this. Mm-hmm. Um, especially if their quality of life is compromised, Mm -hmm. like things like pain, not being able to lie down, not needing, not being Mm -hmm. able to have their feet trimmed, um, Mm -hmm. not being able to eat consistently or properly, these sorts of things, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. when we look at that, it's like, if you really, and coming back to that neutrality place, this is like the hardest place to be neutral, especially with Mm -hmm. your own animals. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. the more neutral you can become the more that you can feel what that animal is truly needing yes honestly they'll tell you they will tell you Mm -hmm. i'm ready Mm -hmm. you'll Mm -hmm. you'll feel it in your bones Mm -hmm. Uh, if you don't resist it you'll feel that Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and you know i think there's there's a lot to be said of of what you just said there is like find neutral and like sit with it and sit with them and feel it and you know a lot of our animals will will stay. And then, you know, it's hard to say like signs, but like when, you know, I was talking and I kind of just acknowledged that, you know, it may be that, you know, she's not going to live a full life and that she will be put down. And then a rain cloud blew through and she, I've been turning her loose. So (laughs) she's she's not going anywhere. So I've just been unclipping her, letting her out of the field, letting her graze wherever she wants on the property. And she was over to my left and this rainbow came up and we we're standing there looking at it. I was like, Oh, that's so pretty. And then she walked over and put the rainbow right into her back. And I took the photo and I was like, oh, okay, thank you universe. Like, but that was also a sign. And I was talking to one of the other trainers mm-hmm. and she said, you know, two days after um, she lost a dog, tragically, he showed her literally, she sent me the photo after and it's a heart in the sky yep. where the sun's coming through. And she's yeah. like, you know, and I see hearts everywhere now. And, you know, some people believe in that, some people don't, but like she was literally eating over there and for whatever reason, just walked over, walked over and put her back right under that rainbow. I took the photo and then the rainbow was gone. And it's like, can't make this stuff up. No, can't make this stuff up, honestly. And there's also, right, like there's this degree, like Shaylee said to me, you know, because she's also going through the same, very similar situation where, you know, she finally has publicly shared that, you know, she found really horrible arthritis in her horse's neck and she's sharing her journey very vulnerably and openly about, you know, how it took so much time for her to finally be ready because she needed to learn these symbols from him and she, you know, needed to be in the place. Um, Mm -hmm. And that, you know, he showed her and then she finally saw it, but she said, you know, since we've decided, like, it's so peaceful and people fear it. But once you know that it's right and they know I'm like and that's I said yeah. to her today I'm like that's what I've been feeling it's like this weird peace yeah. has come across all of us that now we know like we know what's wrong and she's so peaceful and she's yeah. so happy just like being a horse and like knowing that like her knowing that we know yeah you know like we finally totally. know what's wrong she's totally changed yeah and she's so happy and she's so chill and she just you know She's still, and one of her other things is separation anxiety, which I'm like, I help people with that all the time. And yet my own horse still had it. And that's one of the other things that I knew was because she feels, you know, insecure and unsafe. And so she still has, you know, sometimes she'll call and, but, you know, we've been letting her out and she just hangs out and Mm -hmm. grazes and it's just been peaceful and her body's looking softer. And it's like, so interesting how, you know, once you know how they do, they're just like, they change and. Shelly said that, you know, as we were literally taking the x-rays of Bro's neck, he's looking at the vet, like, did you get it? Do you see it? Like, finally, like, you know, it's there. Did yeah. you get it? Does she know? Like, yeah. and, you know, they're they're yeah. so, when you're ready to see it and hear it, and it's very obvious, but also this piece will, will come around. And then, you yeah. know, like, 
if or when it's time, then I'll also know because I've also, you know, opened myself up to that. Um, and you know, it's, it's really tough. Like it's, it's tough and it's not easy, but also when I, you know, accepted that that may be what is what's best for her. I also felt a sense of peace. It was hard and I cried a lot. Like I said, you (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, trying to keep it together. Alexa could definitely hear it in my voice. I'm, you know, really coming full circle and why I didn't even share. So the other part of this was I was, you know, driving with my husband and the baby had fallen asleep. So we were just going for a tour and I just felt called to open podcasts. So normally we don't listen to my podcast in the car. We normally listen to his. And uh, I opened it and it was your talk with Tracy. And it was just right there, you know, and I just clicked on it and, you know, we listened to it. And I was like, again, that's a universe because I, and of course the timing, like I would literally had that call the next morning yeah. with the other lady who was going to be donating her horse to science. And, and I was like, again, it was like the universe. And then, you know, giving me that podcast and then with Tracy. And then I went and saw that your first webinars with Laura were on there. And so I listened to those and now I've been able to send those to a couple other clients and it was all just the universe. And then that night you messaged me like, Hey, you want to be on the podcast? And I was like, girl, you don't know how bad I need to be on this podcast with you. <laughs> like, literally it was the perfect timing. Like I, I needed it. But again, when this is just my life, like literally yeah. I had one friend yeah. joke how I need to write a book because when you're open to receiving and you're open to Mm -hmm. what the universe has aligned for you, it'll literally just like here, like make connection after connection, after connection, after connection. And like, I could tell stories of how I've met people and how I've had opportunities arrive. And like, even, you know, like Dr. Dr. Kate is down in, in North Carolina, stations in North Carolina. Like, you know, I was just in Tennessee and then me and Jolene were talking about meeting at Stacia's and then Celeste and everyone's coming into North Carolina. I'm like, there's something with North Carolina. Clearly I need to go to North Carolina, but it's like all of these connections are happening for a reason and it's all in the timing. So when you start really being open to that, and this is literally my life, like when me and my husband got together at night, you know, that was one of the things that I really had a profound shift uh, that, that spring where I was like, I'm just going to live for myself. And I'm going to start stepping into fear and, you know, like, and then it was just my life has just continued to unfold in ways that are so beautiful and the connections. And literally it's like, ever since I was just like, I stepped into my own purpose and power and was just like, I'm just going to let my intuition, you know, and just follow the feelings and open it up. And it even happened like when I was pregnant with Sage. Oh man, the things that would come up, like my intuition, I think, I think it was a combination of the hormones oh, and this yeah. baby and all the things that were coming and I was receiving a lot more clearly from horses and again, things. And, and that's what I even tell people when I show up, I'm like, I'm just kind of, I just get drawn to places. And, you know, sometimes I would say that they, I don't see things yet, but I feel things. So like I remember one horse in Georgia and I was like, I just felt, I'm like, that's a scar. Like, that's not a marking. Like, that's a scar from something. Yeah. And I had another communicator there and that kind of blew her cover because she was like, do you want to know what he just showed me? Yeah. And and he had been pushed into an irrigation, broken off irrigation pipe and it was a scar. And so there's these little things that, you know, when you're open to it, you will but it's, again, it's very interesting. It's hard to describe because I just get them as, as feelings and then I'll blur yep. stuff out and it'll just be like, I feel like this, or I feel like this, or I'm drawn to certain areas on the horse and I just try and follow that. And, you know, I loved, I just listened to your, your recording with Laura about it, the communication and the neutrality. So mm-hmm. I kind of had an idea of what you're talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. But also you know, the lesson in, in the receivings too, for you and to be with that. And, but it's been so interesting when you open yourself up, like what will continue to arrive. And it makes me super excited for the rest of my life. Cause I'm like, I'm just 34. Like, oh yeah. You're you just know, getting yeah, going. I'm just, I'm just a baby. Yeah, <laughs> You're just, just a baby. baby. Oh, I love that. I love, this, you know, I love it. Just, yeah. Right. It's like this, this roller so cool. just getting started. It's so mm. cool. Well, I have yeah. appreciated our conversation so, so much. And yeah. um, Thank you so it's much been so good. Me. I know there will be more. And mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. hope all of you out there listening, I'm sure that there were golden nuggets here for you today. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We'd love to hear from you if you've got questions. Uh, Betsy, how do people get in touch with you? So you can reach out on um, my Instagram and Facebook are balanced with Betsy. If you just search those, you can find me. I've I've got, well, I'm saying I've got my, my email and I just got my Betsy 
at balance through movement method team.com or dot, dot com. Yes. Dot com. I'm trying to remember or Perfect. easy Betsy Vonda at hotmail.com. I'm just in the process of switching over. But if you find me on Instagram or Facebook, you can Perfect. you can find me. I have a website too, but it's not updated. No, I'm feeling. working on it. You know, I it's know on the, the to-do list. Totally. New mom life. Yeah, New mom it's on life. the to-do list. Oh, yeah. well, it's been an Thank absolute you. pleasure hanging with you and Sage today. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're so welcome. It's been great. And uh, mm-hmm. I appreciate everybody out there tuning in and listening to yeah. our conversation today. I hope you, I probably should have warned you to have your tissues out, but uh, I'm sure you probably oh, picked that yeah. up a little ways long. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So wishing you all a great day. Thanks again, Betsy. Mm-hmm. And we'll chat with you real soon. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Bye, everyone. Hey everyone, and thanks for listening into the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm here today with my friend, colleague, and going into her fourth year of the Whole Horse Apprenticeship, Elsie Reefer. Thanks for being here, Elsie. Thank you. I just wanted to pop on and say a few things about why I love the apprenticeship so much. I feel as though the apprenticeship has changed my life with my horses And as a person, I have met so many amazing friends through this online container and been exposed to professionals and extremely caring horse people that I did not even know existed prior to entering this space. So I will always be grateful for Alexa and the amazing weaving she does between her bodywork knowledge Um, animal communication, and her ability to connect people from around the world in a common mission to bring horse people together for the betterment of the horse. This year, Elsie's going to be back with us more in the capacity of an assistant and helper and mentor this year. And I'm really stoked that she's joining us. And I hope that you decide to join us as well. We start on September the 15th and registration is now open. If you'd like to register, uh, this is a six-month container. I try to keep the cost really accessible for everyone uh, as much as possible. And if you don't have horses, totally okay. You can still come. Anyone with a love of horses is welcome. To find out more about the six-month offering, you can head to bit.ly slash apprenticeship dash 2023. Again, that's bit.ly slash apprenticeship dash 2023. We hope to see you there. Bye for now.